I'm Lara Land, somatic coach and yoga teacher trainer, and this is the Beyond Trauma podcast. What a couple of years we have had. The challenges continue to grow, and more and more of us are experiencing some level of traumatic stress. My commitment here is to bring you the most up-to-date insights on exactly how trauma affects our mind-body-spirit system and how we can work with our bodies to soften its impacts. You will be hearing from trauma survivors and researchers, and together, we are going to incorporate what they have to teach us to heal ourselves and promote the well-being of all those around us. Here we It's out! The Essential Guide to Trauma-Sensitive Yoga is now available everywhere books are sold. This is the book for every yoga teacher, studio, and practitioner who wants to incorporate an inclusive practice to yoga. It's available on my website, laraland.us, and everywhere books are sold. If you're loving this podcast, you are going to love this book. Okay. I'm not crying, you're crying. I just got off with Dr. Pauline Boss, 89 years old, PhD, who invented the term ambiguous loss. This interview has been a long time in the making, and let me tell you, it was so worth it. I was totally fangirling. I've read her books. She coined the term. She coined the term. And I learned so much from this conversation. She goes in depth. She's very subtle. She gives great examples of ambiguous loss. And let me tell you, we've all had it to some degree. We talk about, oh my gosh, we cover it all. You know, when someone is there physically, but they're not really there. And I mean that in every way, in any kind of way. We talk about caregiving, social media. We talk about 9-11, COVID. We talk about resilience and and the dangers and and the positives of that term. We talk about finding meaning. And I really ask her about that because I just find find meaning in this kind of annoying. And she explains it. We talk about hope, groups, the importance of peers. I mean, there is, I just circled notes and what time it was when parts of the conversation came up to highlight because there was so much So if you don't know her, you need to know her. Dr. Pauline Boss, professor at the University of Minnesota, a fellow in the American Psychological Association and American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Yeah, she's. we talk a lot about family therapy and relationship and all the styles of therapy that she uses. She is well-versed in many theories. She's the former president of the National Council on Family Relations. She practiced family therapy for over 40 years. With her groundbreaking work in research and practice, Dr. Boss coined the term ambiguous loss in the 1970s and since then developed and tested the theory of ambiguous loss, a guide for working with families of the missing physically or psychologically. And she talks a lot about the swinging pendulum of, uh, you know, what roles and the way we think about emotions. There's so much. She summarizes research and clinical work in her widely acclaimed book, Ambiguous Loss, Learning to Live with Unresolved Grief, Harvard Press, 2000. In addition to over a hundred peer-reviewed academic articles and chapters, her other books include Lost Trauma and Resilience, Therapeutic Work with Ambiguous Loss, which I read, and Loving Someone Who Has Dementia, How to Find Hope While Coping with Stress and and Grief, and her most recent book, which I listened to on Audible, The Myth of Closure, Ambiguous Loss in a Time of Pandemic and Change. Her work is known around the world wherever ambiguous losses occur, and thus her books are now available in 18 different languages. For more information about Dr. Boss, her writings, and the Ambiguous Loss online training programs, see www.ambiguousloss.com. What a gift. Our most seasoned guest ever at 89, still working, and as she tells you, still learning. This is a wealth of knowledge. You're going to want to listen to this one, not once, but two, three, four times. What a gift. Here we go. Dr. Boss, what a pleasure. It's been nice just 
saying hello to you in a few minutes before hitting this record. I've been a kind of like fangirl excited to get to talk to you, working and writing books at the young age of 89 and uh, contributing so much to the conversation around trauma and ambiguous loss. Yes, this has been a topic I came to in graduate school when I was observing family therapy. And in the 1970s, it was the children were the identified patient, uh, but the family therapist, psychiatrist, demanded that the entire family come in, and fathers were always angry about that at that time. And they said, the children are mother's business, I need to go to work. And of course, he didn't listen to that. The psychiatrist insisted the fathers be there. But in my observation, I realized that almost routinely the fathers were physically present but psychologically absent. And then I wrote my very first academic paper, which was on the psychological father absence in intact families. Um, And so that started it all. But my theory development professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison said, Pauline, it's about more than fathers move it to a more general level. So it took me a long time, but I came up with the term ambiguous loss, which means that anybody can be either physically or psychologically missing. It doesn't have to be just fathers. So I thank that professor. I would have been spending my lifetime studying father absence. Right, right. And they they helped you to see the more, the broad area and coin this term. And I think it's so important to give language to, I mean, it really helps bring something into focus once we have a term for it. Yes. It's strange that people always have an aha moment after they hear the term. Not always, but I would say 90% of the time, even um, newspaper reporters, they'll, they'll be quiet from the moment and they'll say, oh, I had one. And, and, you know, usually they're absolutely right. What, what I've come to realize, though, in retrospect, is that I grew up with ambiguous loss. My, uh, my father was an immigrant. My mother's parents were both immigrants, all from Switzerland. And my father was a very good father, and, and I loved him dearly. And I would notice that every now and then he would be, like, far away especially after he got a letter with a black border around it, which meant someone died. Um, And then he would be grieving, but I didn't know the family he was grieving for back in Switzerland. And that went on for a long time because first it was the Depression, which didn't allow people to have money to go back. And then it was World War II, which didn't allow civilians to cross the ocean. So... He never saw his mother again until about six weeks before she died. And that was, you know, 50 years later. So that experience of immigration and living in a family with immigrants and in a town with immigrants where homesickness was the the theme (laughs) and yearning for the old country was the theme. I think it's very common today. It's just not about Switzerland. It's about other countries. And that immigrants, and we are a country of immigrants, uh, always have an ambiguous loss in the families and the country and the food and the language they left behind. Absolutely. I mean, my I see my own husband. So my, my husband is an immigrant and he moved here for me. And um, sometimes... I see that he's he's just lonely for home. Preoccupied. Yeah. With what's back there. And you also talk about the identity change that comes with that and identity loss. I mean, for many, many folks in this country, they could have been doctors, right, in, in the country where they lived. And they simply can't get that to translate over here. Sometimes they're a cab driver. And they're a cab driver. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, a loss of status, loss of income, a loss of, of your uh, colleagues in, in the field you used to have. It's just, if any immigrant, if you sit them down and say, what are your losses? First of all, you, you need 
you need to say that it's not a debt. Ambiguous loss is simply an unclear loss uh, that has no validation, that has no verification, like loss of status, for example, uh, or like loss of a person across the ocean that you'll never see again. Whereas death is something you have definitive information, you have a death certificate, uh, hopefully. And of course, when there is not that certainty, then that's a physical ambiguous loss. Yeah, maybe you, maybe because we we jumped ahead into some really good stuff. Yeah, maybe you want to. I mean, you started to there to clarify the definition of ambiguous loss and and maybe how it evolved for you. Um, because the the way I read it in your writing is there's like main two types. Yes, the, that's right. Yeah, there's physical and psychological. And so the physical ambiguous loss is when the person physically is gone away from you. And they could be like a soldier missing an action, but it also could be like the youngsters in your family migrated or immigrated away from you. And so they're still alive and well, but you're they're not near you anymore. The psychological ambiguous loss would be when the person is physically in front of you or near you, but their mind is gone or going. For example, dementia, serious mental illness, addiction, or simply more everyday preoccupation with work or with media. And so the person can be sitting at the dinner table with you, but their mind is in their phone. And these are very hard on people. Because you can't quite realize it's a loss and that you could actually be grieving that loss or sad about it um, because no death has occurred. You know, we, we know what to do when a death has occurred. But ambiguous loss is actually more common and more unacknowledged and quite unrecognizable unless, unless we give it a name. And so maybe that's the only thing I have done in all these 45 or 50 years professionally is to give a name to a type of loss that is very common, but unacknowledged. Well, I don't think that's the only thing you've done, but it's a very powerful thing because I think so many of us, so many people listening right now can relate to a relationship where the person, the physical body was there, but the, the person that they knew is not there anymore. Yes. For various Great. reasons. Yes. There are over 80 kinds of conditions and illnesses that cause dementia. But there's also all those other things I mentioned. Where yeah, when, when someone's checked out, not. right? Yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah, exactly. Wow. And, and you say by giving name to it, we can start the process <laughs> of grieving. And coping. I prefer the, the process of coping. Because with ambiguous loss, grief is frozen. You can't move forward with it. You're stuck with it. You have to hold it, and you can't you can't move forward it with it. Just ask the caregiver of someone with terminal illness or with dementia, um, where they're no longer the way they used to be. Could even be a child is born not the way you had hoped for. They're stuck with it. They're sad a lot, and it's almost a chronic sorrow. And so that they're stuck with that. So ambiguous loss causes frozen grief, but giving it a name allows the coping process to begin, which means you cope with something you're stuck with, mm. which is not what we as Americans are accustomed to doing. No. <laughs> no. Just the word, we, just hearing you say stuck makes me want to like get out. Yeah, and you can't. And you can't. And is that where the trauma, because you also, you also did something else. You named it a trauma. That's where the trauma comes in because it causes immobilization. You're stuck with it. You're stuck with your grief. If you start the grief process, many people feel guilty because they think they're declaring their loved one dead or it's premature. They know it's not like a validated death in the family. They're stuck. They're immobilized, and therein lies the trauma. You're right. But it isn't PTSD, because P means post. And 
There's nothing post about this, like a soldier who comes home after he's been in battle. The battle is over, so it's PTSD. But with ambiguous loss, you're stuck with it. So it's, it's trauma, but it's not post. It's constant. It's like keeping your finger in the fire all the time. The oh, torture continues. It's a torture, yeah. And then you have, I, I thought that was really poignant what you said about you can't start to grieve or if you do start to to that process, there's guilt around that, like the moving on. And then what about, because what I, another thing I love that you do is you also talk about the family, because I guess because you came from looking at that perspective from those early years in grad school. So you have different different family members, right, are reacting differently. Right. So it usually predicts family conflict. And it's understandable. I try to, in therapy, try to normalize that because in the absence of clear facts, everybody sees it differently. Should we have a memorial if there's no body? Can we have a burial if there's no body? Will they come back? Somebody will say yes. Somebody else believes they're dead. So family conflict is normal with ambiguous loss or community conflict. Look at the conflict we've had in this country during and after the pandemic. Argument about who the culprit was. Is there a virus? Is there COVID? Is it a hoax? Uh, And huge conflict, which remains with us today on many different subjects. I think it's because we've had a lot of ambiguous losses, the pandemic being the main one. It was epic. We had a villain, and we didn't know what it was. We didn't know how to control it. Many people died, and we couldn't even see the people who were dying, even if they were our own loved ones. And we were held hostage by this virus until the vaccines were developed. Fortunately, rather rapidly. And, and so I think we're still having the um, effects of, I would say, was it three years? Three years of, of experiencing a major, major ambiguous loss from the pandemic. Loss of trust in the world is a safe place. Loss of being with your loved ones. A loss of having your usual routines loss of being able to go out, uh, loss of being able to finish college or have graduations or proms. I can go on and the book lists a lot of them. Yeah, it does. And it really, you know, put forefront in my mind about this collective loss. From one viewpoint, it's collective. We all went through this thing. I see now how it's ambiguous because in a way, You couldn't really see it. Right. And each person is so different. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's hard to see what, first, it's it's hard to see what one lost. Like, I think I'm still processing, you know, what what I lost and the years I lost and the identity. I mean, I had a lot of identity change at that time. And then then trying to be there for others who also went through all that change and loss. And then without playing the, uh, you know, who had it worse, uh, right. Olympics, right? I don't do that. But I think that you talked about earlier, the family argues about the ambiguous loss and how to handle it and what it was and was it real, etc. And what we're seeing now is our family, our national family is still arguing about things like that. And the global family is also. And so the ambiguous losses have, in fact, become community-wide and country-wide and global, not just family-wide. And you say it, it wears us down. Yes, it, it, it's exhausting. Yeah. Just ask the caregiver because you feel, in a sense, trapped. Uh, you don't have control over your own destiny. And during the pandemic, I loved it that some people started baking bread, which you know, that's a wonderful coping mechanism. It gave them a couple hours of control over what they were doing and control over the outcome. Mm-hmm. When in fact, they had no control of, of being, you know, sequestered 
during the pandemic and not being able to go to work and so on. So what you need to do when you have an ambiguous loss is find something you can control and it can be small, you know, (laughs) clean a closet. And sometimes I find myself cleaning the silverware drawer. It it feels good. Uh, anything, and it could be running, it could be physical exercise of another kind, could be playing music, it could be anything you like. And I found during the pandemic, when I was a caregiver, that I found writing to be soothing, because I could control the sentence any way I wanted to. I could control the paragraph. I could shape it the way I wanted to. But I had no control over what was going on uh, with my life as a caregiver, nor did I have control outside regarding COVID. I'm glad you brought this up because I wrote down th- that you wrote about like identifying what can and cannot be changed and what is in our, in mm-hmm. our control. Right. And I was going to ask you, what do you think is in our control? Like, are our emotions in our control? Should we try to control them? Yes, they are in our control. You go inside yourself if you can control what's going outside yourself. That's a very Eastern view. And we need to borrow it because we've gone too far to the other side. Mm, Now, I also want to say what's really good about control. Just think what we have done, uh, NASA has done, and the space people have done. It is awesome. It is unbelievable uh, how they can control a rocket to go and pick up some dirt and come back with it. That's the latest. That's only the latest thing they did. So we are very, very good at mastery and control and solving problems with precision. We're just not good at living with problems that have no solution. Mm. So you say kind of don't focus on trying to solve a problem that can't be solved. You're in, you're, you're living with this Mm -hmm. ambiguous loss that, you know, the person you're caretaking for, this is going to go on. What you look then to what can you control in your life? And you could start as small as, you know, I can control making this meal tonight. And then maybe building into, I can actually control, like, my perspective on this right now. Yes, we have more control than we think. And look to the Eastern and more Buddhist views about how they do that. They go inside their mind and their bodies to, to control what they can. And, you know, you probably have come to this thought already. It's the serenity prayer, isn't it? I did 40 years of research before I realized it was in this. <laughs> yeah, well, there's all different ways of, of kind of saying things that right hit different people differently. It's true. Yeah. It's true. But yes, there are a lot of, and by the way, I don't denigrate anything we can control. You know, I want my accountant to have, uh, to be precise. Two plus two has to equal four. Um. But there are things in life that have no solutions. One is death, and the other is ambiguous loss. There may be others as well, as you know. But those are the two. The ambiguous loss is where I've uh, focused. But let me say a, a word about death. The literature and the research on grief has changed. Uh, it is now that you can live with grief. Mm. as long as you find meaning in it, some kind of meaning in it. And that could even be that it's meaningless. For example, the death of a baby or a suicide or someone killed by friendly fire, etc. That'll never make sense. Yeah. Uh, And so you live with um, saying, with giving it a label, it's a meaningless loss. But we don't use Kubler-Ross's five stages anymore. And I like Kubler-Ross. We both had Swiss fathers, Swiss families. And we have to read her latest books where she denounces the five stages. Yes. And she says, it's messy. It's not in neat stages. So 
any stage model implies that if you do step one or step two, step three, then you have closure. You're finished with the pain and suffering. That's an illusion. You're being duped. And she is. She says that in different words, but that's essentially what she's saying. The five ideas are fine, but they're not in neat stages. And the six guidelines I give for living with ambiguous loss are in a circle, and I try to point out that they're messy. And you can't say you're ever over it. That's why families with ambiguous losses do not like the term moving on. Mm. And, but they will accept the term moving forward, which implies you're moving forward, but also remembering the person who's missing. That is so good. Isn't that amazing that they come up with knowledge that always astounds me? Oh, yeah. Yes. (laughs) If we allow ourselves to learn, right, from our clients and to listen, like they know what they need. Yes. It's like the number one. And they'll teach us. I love that. I think that's such good advice, you know, for any of us who are a friend to someone going through this. You know, we don't want to say like, have you moved on? Are you starting to move on? When are you going to move on? Or say like, you know, you need to find closure, which is your big no-no, especially. Um, Yeah. yeah. It's a good word for closing a real estate deal or a road in the winter here in Minnesota. But it's a terrible and it's a harmful word to use in human relationships. People yeah. hate it yeah. for experiencing it. Do not use it and tell the media to stop using it too. But Anderson Cooper is the one media person who has had many losses and he will stop a panel in the middle of a discussion and criticize them for using the word closure. I just love him for that. I love that. And the honesty. Yes, the honesty. And changing the dialogue, especially in media, you know, Once they're on to a phrase, it's like each one repeats the next, right? Yes. Someone someone strong like that with, you know, that kind of fame needs to come out and and make those changes. Stephen Colbert does too. Mm, Yeah. And if you ever get them talking together, I think it might even be on YouTube, they will denounce the word the idea of closure. They know that you never forget people you love even after they have died. And it's even worse if they're missing uh, because you not only have the loss of them, but you have the loss of knowing where they are or if they're dead or alive. It's, It's awful. I actually cannot imagine going through that. You referenced your uh, six, what what did you call it? I want to say it's not stages. exactly. Guidelines. Do you think you'd like to share some of those with us? Sure. We don't want to just talk about the problem without any kind of (laughs) look at what to do. Your listeners have to envision a circle now. Okay. Because while I'll read them one after another, it's not a line. It's a circle, and it's a messy circle. You can go back and forth and start anywhere you like or repeat one. They're based on pillars from psychology and sociology. You'll recognize some of them from, you know, Psych 101 or Social 101. The the first one I'll discuss is finding meaning, which means what I was saying before. In order to live with a loss, you need to come to some kind of meaning about it. For example, when my little brother died of polio in the 50s, the summer before the sock vaccine came out, my family and I made meaning out of it by a purpose of increasing research funds. So we would go door to door collecting dimes for the March of Dimes. I know that sounds minimal now, but that's what it was back then. And it did make a difference and the March of Dimes exists still today because polio is still not eradicated. So we found meaning, as many people do, in helping to prevent other people from having this tragedy in their family. Okay. So it doesn't mean you have to like, kind of say, I know why this happened to me. Do you have to say that like this happened so I could help others? Because I always found that just doesn't sit right with me. 
it would be different for every family. For example, if your 90-year-old grandparent dies, the grandchild might say, it was expected. I understand this death. But that might only occur in one case. And it's so different for everybody. In my book, I write about a woman after 9-11 in New York City. She was she had a newborn baby right after her husband went missing in the trade towers that collapsed. And she was distraught, extremely distraught, crying a lot as we worked with the families. It wasn't until some time later, at least a year, maybe more later, because her newborn baby was walking at that time. And I just said to her in the in this group meeting that we had in New York City, something about your son is lovely. And she said, remember that story I told you at first, that it was my fault that my husband uh, went missing, that he was in the building at 9 a.m. and usually he's out before, but his alarm clock didn't go off. And so he was late to work. I thought it was my fault. And I said, yes, I remember that. You were very distraught. And she said, I now see it differently. It means something different to me now. She said, he always set the alarm clock himself. I never did. So I think he just wanted one more hour to be with us before he died. So now she has a transformation in meaning from self-blame, self-guilt, which is harmful, to a meaning she can live with and pass on to her children for the rest of her life. It's a positive meaning. But these take a while to come to. It doesn't happen overnight. Does it come to you? Do you work on it? Is it a combination? It comes from talking with peers. Mm. It could come from talking with a therapist, but believe it or not, it comes quicker from talking with peers in a group who suffer from the same kind of ambiguous loss. That makes so much sense. Yes. So you're listening and talking to somebody who's also walking in the same shoes. And I think that's important. And while you can go to therapy, you don't know if the therapist has walked in the same shoes. Plus, there is power in a system of more than one person, more than two people. There's power, and we had three generations of people, grandmothers, mothers, and daughters, or sons. It was the labor union hall where we did this. So the missing people were both mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. So what you want is a transformation in meaning from self-blame or self-harm. I'm going to kill myself. I can't live without this person or I'm going to kill the person who did it. So you need to have another kind of meaning. And it comes from talking and listening to others in the same shoes. So the next guideline we called adjusting mastery. And I alluded to that about how good we are at going into outer space, which requires ultimate mastery, control, and precision. But we're not so good when we have a problem that has no solution like the pandemic, like the trade towers being attacked, like dementia, and so on. So we have to borrow from more Eastern philosophies about how to live with a problem that has no solution. And we can do that. And we have to, third, reconstruct our identities to do that. You know, am I still a wife if my husband has been missing in action for 20 years? And the answer becomes both and. As caregivers, too, now say the same thing. If my wife no longer knows who I am, am I able to have another relationship? And the answer is both and. You must keep your relationship to your ailing wife, even if she doesn't know you, by visiting and touching and and making sure she's safe. And you can have a social life to keep yourself healthy. One or the other is not right. There are frequently people think, by the way, I just talked with a woman who was a caregiver for 25 years, doing nothing but caring for her husband. 
And now she doesn't know quite what to do to take care of herself. She's not accustomed to doing that. So we must take care of ourselves along the way with a both end. And I'm talking about when the person you're caring for no longer knows who you are. The next one, and so reconstructing identity is important. Yes, I am a wife. I am a husband. I am both a wife or a husband, and I can have a social life. The next one is normalizing ambivalence, which means the guilt that you feel from having a missing person and then saying, I wish it was over, and then realize you meant you wish they were dead, and then feeling guilty about it, and so on. All those messy feelings you have are normal. And so you have to know that this is not a psychiatric ambivalence that you're having. It's the social ambivalence. It's from the relationship being ruptured. And it's not your psyche, your mental health. Uh, It's a different kind of ambivalence we're talking about. And then next, you have to revise attachment to somebody who's ambiguously lost. You want to stay attached to them. This is the both end again. And you must attach to something that is fully present for you in order to keep your own sanity and health. So you do both. You stay attached. You do care about anybody you've ever had an attachment to, even if they're gone, even if they're dead, even if they're missing. We couldn't ask you not to. But you can also do both and. I both still love the person who's missing, care about him or her, and I have some new friends or new relationships. And then finally, uh, discovering hope. Again, look at this as a circle. So discovering hope is right next to the first one, finding meaning. Viktor Frankl said there was no hope without meaning and there's no meaning without hope. A lot of what I do is based on Viktor Frankl. I saw that. <laughs> I was like, is she an existentialist? But then there's narrative in there, I guess. Is, yes, I studied with Carl, Carl Whitaker, who was existential of therapy, experiential therapy. And yes, you know, my training sort of knocked me out of my Swiss um, orderly background. <laughs> And and I'm glad it did, because when you're studying ambiguity, you have to let go of orderliness and precision. Mm. So we end with discovering new hope. And I'm sorry that some people thought I meant hoping for, continue hoping that the lost person comes back to normal or comes out of the jungle. No, I did not mean that. I meant new hope. Find, discover something new to hope for. Yeah. Because this illness or this condition or this kidnapping may never be solved. So you have to find something new to hope for. Maybe to live a life that this missing person would be proud of. Or it might be many people join um, organizations to change laws. Uh, so that kidnapping might not happen again to somebody else, or this disease might find a cure, so they raise money for it. There's different ways people find hope. Mm -hmm. and But it is necessary. And if you don't think of it as hope, think of it as a purpose in life that would honor the person who is missing. In my case, if finding new hope came after my husband died through writing, writing about him. It was a way to honor him. And writing for me, as I said earlier, is a way to find some control in my life when I can't control what is happening outside of myself, like death or like ambiguous loss. You have to find it for yourself. But try to discover something new to hope for and something, some new purpose in life, not just to stand and wait for the ambiguity to clear up because it might never clear up. Yeah, I think that's one of the most powerful things that you say and say over and over. And it's it's something that I've found myself saying for many years. It's like this idea of this both and and being able to hold two things that seem in conflict 
mm-hmm. our opposites, being able to, I don't know, I always visualize it as kind of like, just like wrapping a sphere around that, <laughs> but being able to hold two things, um, two opposites as truths. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who's the favorite here in St. Paul, he's our honored son, wrote that the um, sign of intelligence is being able to hold two conflicting ideas in your mind at the same time. That's really what I'm talking about. It's like dialectics, but often there's no resolution with missing people. So we do have to hold two opposing ideas in their mind at the same time. And as I said before, I do not want my accountant to do that. Mm -hmm. But for certain things that happen to us, like illness, sickness, people going missing, kidnapped, that is the only way you can live with it. And it's a stress model I'm talking about, not a medical model. You have to lower the stress of not knowing. And you do that by holding two possibilities in your mind at the same time. Oh, that is, Ooh, that is so big. I want to just say that you have to lower the stress of not knowing. Right. Yeah. And yes. you do that by holding both. Mm-hmm. The stress of the mind circling in that trauma and trying to resolve, fix, close this thing that can't be fixed is what right is what causes the trauma. In New York, a, a reporter came a year after 9-11 to my office at Hunter, where I was a, a visiting professor. He said, referring to New Yorkers, why aren't we over it yet? <laughs> and I said, because you're trying to get over it. Mm. And New Yorkers will never get over it. You know, they they will both always remember 9-11 and move forward with life in a new way. They're doing fine, but they ne- they'll not forget, yeah. nor will the rest of us in this country. I mean, we won't forget the pandemic, will we? No. No. No, and it, it even reminds me of, like, there was a time in my life where I thought, kind of had this mindset of arriving somewhere. And then I finally gave up and realized that there's always more to learn and you never really get there. And there's a relaxation that comes with that. That's right. I'm still learning new things at 89. I'll tell you, one of them happens to be technology. It's not fun, but I, I actually learn a little bit and then I feel proud. You know, I, you just don't end learning. You don't end solving some unsolved issues. By the way, that may be why mystery stories are so popular uh, in this country and in England. Uh, People want a clear-cut solution at the end of every story. Yes. (laughs) Just know that that's good. Use that for your entertainment, but that life isn't that way. I hope it is much of the time for you, but there will be times when there is no solution and you're going to have to live with either clear-cut loss, such as death, or ambiguous loss. And you can do it. People have astounded Mm. me about how resilient they are in doing this. You can do it. Yeah, when I run my trainings and we do our group agreements, and I got this from Michelle Cassandra Johnson, one of the things we agree is that we, we will leave things untied up, you know, <laughs> you won't leave this training knowing everything and you might leave more confused, you know, and we just agree that, that it won't, it won't end in this pretty package. No, no, that's, that's accounting. I have a, <laughs> there's a couple of things you said that I, I want to dig into a little more while we have time. One is around the, uh, identity change. Mm-hmm. I was just, when I was reading that in your book, and then again, now I was just thinking about how sometimes we are quicker to change or ready to change our identity, but the people around us aren't ready for us to change our identity, right? Like I don't see myself just as wife anymore. Like I give myself the freedom to go out and meet other people. And I know that's healthy. And I know that, you know, I've done right by, by my partner, right. Who's maybe not, not all there anymore. Um, But the others around resist. And I wonder if just from all your years, you know, in this subject matter, if you had tips for people or I I really thought when I was reading your book about people going through 
trans, like a uh, gender transition, you know, who are ready to change. Yeah, the ambiguous loss model is used in gender transition research now, but not for the person transitioning. They do not have an ambiguous loss. Mm-hmm. Right. Their family and friends do. Right. And so th- they're feeling fine. Uh, but their family and friends say, gee, I, you know, I was thinking she'd be a bride one day and now she's, she's a boy. And, and so we have to be empathic to that kind of transition that family and friends are going through. It, it is a, I mean, a totally different mindset. So they, get, they use the both end model too. And, and they do use calling it ambiguous loss. But let me get back to something you said about identity. Let's take, for example, um, should we take a caregiver, for example, who is now going out to dinner and her her mate is in a nursing home not knowing who she is anymore? The the neighbors will talk. Is that what you were referring to? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you, you know, for someone who that's hard for if there are, you know, some skills that they can use to... The the biggest um, help will be for for the caregiver to find peers. She should be, she or he should be in a peer group of like-minded people who are also caregiving people in memory units, not early onset. We're not talking about early onset now. We're talking about well deep into dementia. So they should have a peer group so that they can test their ideas and actions with somebody who's walking in the same shoes as they are. The neighbor down the street might not get it. And you just have to ignore that. Although I encourage people like you, you're doing a podcast to educate the public. Media people should educate the public so that they are less harsh and judgmental. They also are judgmental with people who don't cry at a funeral. You don't cry enough at the funeral. And it's because people who have had loved ones with a long terminal illness or with dementia have been, you know, sad along the way. They have no tears left. And we should be more compassionate about their situation if they they may even feel relief at the point of death then they'll feel guilty for that. And we don't need to jump onto that guilt. I understand the relief. It's a both end. I both feel sad my husband died and relief that he's not in pain anymore. Yeah, I had a woman on uh, Whitney Allen who's a grief coach for um, widows and she gets a lot of flack on social media because she's found another partner. And, you know, there's all that flack that she's done it too soon. And, um, yeah. You know, I'm not on social media. So at 89, I'm probably not the one to speak to this. But it seems to me you need to ignore some things. Yeah. Uh, Some people are not very smart. Some people are not empathic at all. Uh, You need to talk with peers who are experiencing the same thing you you are a grief group, uh, a if it's a death, a, um, a caregiver group if it's that, um, if it's a small child who has some disabilities, find your peers, find your peers wherever they are. They're all out there, and talk with them. They will be more understanding of what you're going through. People on social media do not know. Yeah, find your peers. I love that. That's, yeah, that's and you can friend. find your peers online, by the way, but in in formal um, peer groups, organized peer groups. Yeah, and, and peer groups can be helpful online, not just in person. But ordinary social media can be mean. Yeah, this is true. You do know a lot about it, <laughs> even without being there. You know the important parts. <laughs> the well, way I watch my children and grandchildren yeah so, but but they are they aren't huge on social i think they're more moderate i'm not sure what do i know about them right <laughs> uh, yeah it's hard to be moderate on there but you know we're striving we're trying <laughs> 
Right. You mentioned um, res- resilience as well, and I, I wouldn't want to leave our conversation without talking about resilience a bit. Resilience is a good thing. It's a, 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 a scientific body of literature that came out of uh, scientists that studied street children in Hawaii, poor children who lived on the street, and found that some of them were very competent. Now, we need to know that resilience was born out of the literature on poverty, which means that uh, scientists, child development scientists, were happy to see that some kids did well despite poverty. It has grown into a field that instead of being called competence, it's called resilience now, and we value it. It means that you can cope with adversity and come out at the other end of it stronger than before. And it's a good thing. You know, so many of us are stronger than we were before the pandemic, living with three years of not knowing what the heck was going on and being isolated on top of it. But the problem is that with resi- resilience can be also overvalued because it means that the same people who are having trouble need to be tough and resilient. And I'm talking about people in poverty, black families, people of color migrants, people who have no job, we expect them to be resilient and we don't expect other people to be resilient. That's right. And what happens with that, and by the way, comes from the slave tradition when slaves were mistreated and no medical help, nothing, but survived and got stronger for it. Some of them died. It would survival of the fittest happened. But what happens is that the immune system is weathered. There's a weathering that takes place that the researchers are finding now so that the people who are forced to be resilient all the time, let's say living in the bad part of the city, being afraid of guns, kids who are now afraid to go to school because of guns, that that affects the immune system and can shorten the lifespan. So we have to be careful about over over honoring resilience if we expect it to be the same people all the time saying things like it's okay they're in poverty they're resilient no it's not okay uh, we need to deal as a society with the things that require resilience so that some people don't have to be resilient every day of their lives what happens is they're always on alert yeah so the fight or flight um mechanism in their bodies is high all the time. And that's what erodes and weathers their immune system. Yes. That it's a stress on the body. It's a stress it's a on the system. On the body. It's a that's constant right. stress. And yet uh, on the other end, we see, you know, folks with maybe a lot of privilege and a lot of power who really could use some building of of resilience. Yes. They're they're leaning on their privilege uh, instead of building their own resilience because at some point in time when that privilege is taken away, they fall apart. I think there's some nursing home studies about women who had to work hard all their lives and, and could survive adversity, do better in a nursing home than women who had privilege. You know, when you can't have your way, then you adapt. Yeah. Yeah. But adaptation, again, is what you don't want to have to adapt all your life long. You want sometimes for life to be serene. Yeah. Yeah. I think that this is a great explanation. And it's just, I'm laughing because it's like, this is where it gets too complicated for a meme, right? So folks need to look at themselves and think, where am I? You know, understand your own identity. Do I need to build resilience or do I need to, and maybe help change systems that are forcing so many to have to be resilient all the time? You know, where can I take some of that um, off of someone else? Right. Right. And let me talk about, because of your age group, let me talk about children. Please. I think that lately, when I grew up, there were, or I read about boys and girls who came at age 14 on a ship alone and immigrated through Ellis Island and so on. 
these were resilient kids and probably were resilient all their lives. But once they got here, maybe life was not dangerous anymore. What I see now, and and by the way, that's really expecting too much of a 14-year-old, but that's that happened a lot. What happens now is I think we've overprotected our children so that they can't cope with stress very well anymore. And I think that's very dangerous to have a whole generation like that. I don't mean to overgeneralize, but people are saying uh, there's a mental health crisis in the teenagers and and, um, school children. I don't think there's a mental health crisis if you assume about a third of the population might have serious depression and anxiety, but about two-thirds don't, yet they have sadness and anxiety. But that would be a normal reaction to an abnormal situation we've just been through for three years. And we're not out of the woods yet, by the way. Um, so we have to be careful about pathologizing our kids. And then we also have to strengthen them, let them solve their own problems more than we do now. Um, again, the 14-year-old crossing the ocean, coming here alone, that's not what I mean. I just mean that we've been overprotective. And sometimes it's been necessary because of the dangers in our society, which require us to make changes in our society, not in our kids. It's an expensive change if we make our kids more docile and more uh, unable to solve problems and cope with stress. That's a danger. I am like, preach. Yes. (laughs) Yes. This is so important. And you're brilliant. I love speaking to you. Um, you've spoken so much, so much to really the wisdom of your years, I think, is it it comes forth because you've seen the pendulum swing, right? I have. Same mm-hmm. thing like you were saying about leaning into some of the the eastern tenants, right? Because we talked a lot about, you know, feel your feelings and bring, you know, all your emotions are valid and Mm-hmm. and don't block your feelings, which is an important message for the right person at the right time. And on the other end, we also need to hear the message of like, I have control over my feelings and I can be aware of my thoughts and what you know my thoughts are telling me. And there's some space there where I can build mastery. And so again, it comes to that both and, right? We can hold And society needs different messages, I guess, for different times. But boy, do we tend to swing really far on the pendulum. Oh, we do. And we're in a troublesome spot right now. I'm an optimist. I think we'll come out of it. It's certainly as troublesome as the 60s was. But this one has, it just seems like more guns involved in the trouble. Yeah. And I just think it's a dangerous time. And I think Young people have to get involved and run for office and make changes and be on the school board. And I don't think you can be lethargic about what's going on. I think it needs to change. I absolutely agree. And and we have to teach our young people to be able to deal with some with some stress and to face conflict and and, and they have to go through that. They have to have some risks. You know, mom and dad cannot be making every call for them um, and they have to feel consequence. I mean, this is so important. And we talk about a lot in my family, you know, sometimes the parents are more afraid of the child's feelings and um, they can't hold their tears. You know, they they can't watch them cry like we have to be able to watch to to allow them to to cry and fail and all those things because they need that. I was just going to boat ride in Glacier National Park and sitting indoors. So there were some families there. And I couldn't believe what I saw when the child slapped his father. And I don't want to say in my day, I don't want to say that. But I think parents, Sal Mnuchin and the strategic family therapist taught us that there has to be a hierarchy of power. And the children cannot be in in power, can't be in control. And, and sometimes you can let them be in control, like I say, solve their own stressful problems. But there have to be boundaries. And I, I just couldn't believe what I saw. And believe that they want it. That's actually what they're looking for, right? 
They really, they want to know where those boundaries are. They crave they do it. Want, they do want it. Their anxiety yeah. goes down if they know. Yeah, you know, yeah mm-hmm. so we're doing them a disservice, parents, when we don't give them that. Um, I'm actually, I want to ask you, coming around for, full circle, have our fathers changed? I know we started this episode with, uh, have you seen a change in our dads? Oh, my goodness. I'm just mesmerized at the grocery store when I see a young father holding a baby or pushing a a stroller or, you know, I'm just mesmerized by it. I stop and watch because in my day, fathers were not involved with the children. Oddly enough, my own father was, and we were around him a lot, but he was a farmer. And so we could be around him a lot. And he was very gentle and kind. I think I had an unusual father. He was also an artist. More more likely it was patriarchy back yeah. then. Um, today, it seems to me more double responsibility for the children. And if it's gay couples, it would be the two parents. And straight couples, it's still the two parents. It's lovely to see. It just blows my mind. Mm. I love it. Well, I'm glad to hear that. This has been incredible speaking with you. Have have there been gaps in what I've asked you? Is there something? No, you have good questions. It's been very good, I think. Yeah, for me, it it has been quite powerful. I mean, people need to read your books. We will definitely link them in the show notes. Yes, and for them to know that while I am an academic, I'm known for writing without jargon and in a more everyday way. It's probably because English was not my first language. The books are definitely um, accessible for, you know, anyone who's looking for deeper knowledge about ambiguous loss, which I think we've made clear in this episode that we've all gone through, right? Uh, I'm just in it in ourselves and others. They're also great for therapists, caregivers, I mean, you are definitely eclectic in your approach. And I think um, for me as a, you know, a student, it's really wonderful to see how you're incorporating the different theories and theoretical approaches in a very specific way, not mushing them, you know, but really using them in a, in a really clear and effective way. So um, yeah, I just think there's just such a wealth of knowledge there. Do you want to share? I know you're not on social media, but maybe people can go to your website if they want to read more about you. Uh, yes, ambiguous www.ambiguousloss.com. And I write about myself in my books too. The 2006 book is the textbook for professionals, though ordinary people read it too. But the other books are easy and faster reads for the busy therapist as well, but for the ordinary citizen as well. So enjoy the, the, earliest, the earliest book, the first one from Harvard Press, 1999-2000, has sold over 50,000 copies and is in many foreign languages. That's also an easy read. But The Myth of Closure, my last book, is an update of that and also an easy read. It's fantastic. I Actually, I listened to it on Audible, and I think you really bring in the cultural context and what we've all been through um, in the last year. So it's very relevant to what we're going through right now and to better understand ourselves and each other and gain more empathy for each other and more skills at how to relate to each other, right? Like not saying move on. <laughs> uh, don't say move on and don't say close. Yes, <laughs> and, um, and just growing, continuing to grow. Thank you so much, Dr. Boss. You are incredible. What a gift to have this time with you. It's been a long time in the making. um, And I'm just really, really honored that you've agreed to spend this time with me. Thank you. Our guests, our listeners are uh, very, very lucky. Thank you, Lara. It was a pleasure. As we buzz around the busy world, it becomes clear there are billions of paths. As we buzz around the busy world, we will appear in other people's photographs. As we speed through the centuries, we will collide and the light will bend. We will be accidentally immortalized in someone else's land.